be too short a video. Okay. So you want to start with the video? Sure. Ces camps a été a commencé à transformer le Haran à partir du XIVe siècle. C'est vraiment une vieille histoire, c'est campoise. Il y a un savoir-faire historique, hein. on n'est pas depuis 1936 à ces camps, sans avoir un certain savoir-faire qui a été euh, traduit de génération en génération. Et notre filière de création de pêche française, c'est un, un projet qui me tenait beaucoup à cœur. Ça fait deux ans qu'on travaille sur le projet pour pouvoir recréer à ces camps une filière complète de pêche française, de filet de harangue pêche française. On a euh, historiquement eu des liens d'amitié avec euh, la famille de Lem. Ce sont euh, deux familles, euh, ce n'est pas un bout de papier qui, qui nous unit, c'est vraiment aussi euh, voilà, euh, une volonté, des convictions fortes de, de recréer cette filière et d'offrir aux consommateurs un produit, euh, un produit français, un produit euh, local, euh, transformé localement par une société française et, euh, et basée à Fécamp, je trouve ça euh, super. Et cette filière, c'était aussi quelque chose qui me tenait à cœur, c'est de pouvoir retrouver tout le savoir-faire à la fois local et régional. Donc tout ça, c'est de l'histoire, c'est euh, un savoir-faire. Et le savoir-faire est important. Le fait de vouloir euh, transformer du hareng français, c'est qu'on retombe sur du hareng qui a été pêché pendant une période précise et un rang qui correspond à ce que moi je considère être comme le poisson roi de la région. En termes de, de, de période de pêche, c'est très important parce que ça nous donne juste le taux de gras qui n'est pas trop important et qui reste quand même suffisamment existant pour permettre le goût à ce produit. Oui, ce qu'on qu peut garantir à ces poids et donc aux consommateurs, c'est avant tout une traçabilité du poisson. Euh, on saura exactement euh, euh, quand le poisson est raché ses poids, où est-ce qu'il a été pêché et quand, euh, et puis euh, euh, le comment. Euh, et donc je suis en mesure de garantir à ses poids une qualité de pêche euh, en mer et de congélation en mer, puisque le, le poisson est congelé directement en mer. Euh, Aujourd'hui, euh, le poisson euh, est congelé dans les 3 à 18 heures qui suivent euh, sa pêche. Euh, donc c'est extrêmement rapide, euh, ça permet de conserver tout le pouvoir nutritionnel du poisson. Euh, en termes de qualité intrinsèque du produit, c'est on ne peut pas faire beaucoup mieux. Alors, en ce qui concerne ces poids d'algog, on n'est pas à vouloir garder du rendement pour du rendement. On essaye d'avoir une qualité de produit et un fumage qui correspond à ce que moi j'ai connu quand j'étais gamin et ce que mon père m'a appris. Euh, Aujourd'hui, euh, on aime bien un bon plat mijoté, qu'il soit de viande ou de poisson, parce qu'il euh, rappelle certainement aussi des souvenirs d'enfance. On a euh, des gens qui sont chez nous depuis de nombreuses années. Euh, on avait envie et on avait un souhait vraiment de pouvoir prolonger l'emploi à Fécamp. Nos parents on, nous ont transmis ça. Et je pense qu'on est dans un milieu, en plus de ça, un milieu maritime. Euh, la pêche, c'est des hommes, c'est un savoir-faire, c'est une qualité, c'est de l'humain. Génial. Euh, alors, du coup... Great. So I think everybody has managed to see the video. I hope that um, you will manage to get something from it. I will then move on to the presentation. We're actually going to do a small quiz on the video. So I would ask you to open your mic and to give your answers. You can also give your answers in the chat if you want. So I'm going to do a screen share now. I will do it this way so I can handle the slides myself. Yeah, I'm able to, do my, to share my screen. So I guess I could do it myself, if you don't mind. Okay, I'll stop sharing. Thanks so much. Yeah. Yeah. Up. Voilà. So here we go. Um, the first question is, uh, la première question, pardon, 
c'est euh, All right, so we've got the first question here. So, uh, what do you think the size of the boats? What do you think is the size of the boat that you can see in this video? Does anyone have any answers? Yes. Est-ce que vous voulez bon après je peux vous donner un petit peu des indices. Right. So I can give you some clues. So these um, are boats where you freeze on board. They use a certain type of netting that trawls behind the boat, but Yes, as you can see in the video, it is sort of a propaganda video of um, a certain company that fishes, France Pédagogique, as well as another one that conserves them, um, that preserves some um, herring. And they are explaining that they make great fish, great quality, but they don't really show how they fish it, even though they insist on traceability. The video doesn't say much about it. Does anybody have anything to say? on um, what they think is the uh, size of the boat. Judith? In the chat, I put 30, but I would say it's between 30 and 50, actually. Uh, Sam, 15. Zoe, could you read what is in the chat? Vous me dites... Right. These are boats that are more than 80 meters long, so they're minimum 80 meters long. They're really gigantic boats, as we can say. They are very large um, trawlers, as you can see in the photo. So these are boats that are longer than 80 meters. So this helps us to provide some distance. But in the video, they're talking about the fish, um, fish quality, but not saying much about traceability. Now, second question, what quantity of fish can be fished by this type of boat in a day? So I'll let you answer either in the chat or you can open your mic as well and just speak. We aren't, there aren't very many of us. So feel free to take the floor should you wish to. Sam guesses 100 kilograms. Okay. Est-ce que donc là on est sur un bateau? Right. So this is a boat that's longer than 80 meters, as we said, with a freezer on it. So this is in tons. Clearly more than 30 tons a day. Much more actually. More than double. Right, still, still, still above that. Charlene said 50 tons, but it should be more than that. So we're between 150 and 200 tons of fish per day. So this fish is a lot, even too well. It fishes an, ast an astronomical quantity of fish. And so these boats will need a lot of fish to be affordable. They'll need to fish a lot. And this requires a large quota so that they have the right to fish that kind of quantity. So between 150 and 200 tons of fish per day, you need many fishing rights. Knowing that some boats um, that weigh 100 kilos, um, that will weigh one ton per day. So now we saw these large trawlers in the video and that's a company called France Pélagique. And my question is, when you watch this video, what do you think is the origin of the capital of France Pélagique, knowing that this company is indeed called France Pélagique, knowing that um, Pélagique means open sea? Uh, 
And Judith is guessing that the origin of the capital is Dutch. Yes, c'est vrai, c'est ça. Yes, that is true. So France Pélagique is a subsidiary of a multinational known Cornice Hydraulique. And so the shareholders on these boats are Dutch millionaires. So this is not a little local company. No, this is a large multinational with over 50 subsidiaries in the world. So a very large company. There's another Dutch company. Um, as you can see on the screen, they're the two largest um, companies from the Netherlands and they have a fishing quota and they do this by buying companies in other countries like in France. So France Pélagique is part of one of these subsidiaries. And so the boats that we show you in the video, they are boats that are actually from the Netherlands. Next question, in which port is the fish unloaded, the fish you see in the video? So let me remind you that um, we're talking about preserving a certain type of um, fish, a certain type of, um, um, that they say is, um, is, um, is fished. And now what country is this unloaded into? So please do um, take the floor to answer or answer in the chat. So, so remember that this is a local fish, um, but these are companies that are from the Netherlands. Not bad, getting closer. It's in Hiruiden in the Netherlands. This is a port where most of these large trawlers unload. So the fish that you see in the video is all unloaded in the Netherlands and it's then sent over in um, a truck. So it's not really a local fish, even though Ficon is in the north of France, although not quite next to the Netherlands, whereas in the video you are told that it's local fish. Here on the bottom right, you can see the, the port. Now, what country quota did these boats use to fish? I did sort of give you the answer, so you should get there quite quickly. Does anybody have any idea? As I explained before, these um, Fishing companies have strategies to be able to have the biggest quota. So they are Dutch companies, but they fish under French quota. And so they are members of, of a producer organization. This is actually in the institution who distributes the quota. And so they are a member of the From Nord producer organization. It's a French organization. And so you have a huge 80 meter boat with Dutch capital with, under French quota who belong to a French producer organization. And so they compete for resource actors, for resource access with um, artisanal companies and small companies. Now there's a man in the video called Geoffroy Delem. I think he's on the left in the video with his little blazer. Now, this isn't a great question because I'm asking you, who is Geoffroy Delem, the director of France Pélagique? So I'm actually going to give you the answer straight away because it's not a very well drafted question. I'm struggling to move forward here. So here he is. You see him in the video and he's actually the son of a man called Antoine Delem, who's the founder and ex-director of France Pélagique. France Pélagique being the French branch who owns the boats. But this branch isn't really French because it's a subsidiary of a Dutch um, Dutch group, as we said before. And actually his dad, the dad of the person in the video, he's vice president of the National Fishery Committee, as well as uh, the president of um, the producer organization from Nor, which we talked about before. That's the organization that distributes fishing quota to these boats. 
And so the father of the director is president of um, the organization that distributes quota. So it's actually very easy for Jafar Dilem and the Dilem family to get a maximum of quota for these giant trawlers. And then the fish directly goes to the Netherlands, creating advantages for Dutch shareholders. Now, what do you think are the consequences of um, fish, this uh, fishing for employment in Ficon? Now, in the video, there was another man telling you about expertise. Um, that's all he talks about. And you see people, especially women, working with herring. So what do you think are the consequences for this type of fishing on employment in Ficon? Do you have anything to say? Do you, let's say, do you think it's rather positive for local employment or rather negative? Did anybody have any ideas? In the chat, does anyone have anything to say? I feel like there aren't too many ideas floating around is done in Fécamp. Oui, voilà, euh, yes, we're talking about Fécamp the whole time and that's where the fish are processed. So, unfortunately, there's no more traditional fishing in Fécamp as you can see in the picture. So actually the boats, the fishing boats historically used to be in all of the areas. So here you can see that there are two large areas with them um, leisure boats, pleasure boats, and then on the right you've got a small area with three or four small boats as well as the um, the, the rescue boats. So that's what's left of traditional fishing in Ficon. So actually there are really no more boats. It's an old port, it's a very famous port for herring, but there's no traditional boats left because the large trawlers have taken over the quotas, destroyed resources, and so there are no more fishermen. The only ones who are left are those who work on the large trawlers. They are pretty good living conditions, but unfortunately this has completely killed traditional fishing in the area for herring. So to conclude, the man does say that when it comes with the intrinsic quality of the product, we can't do much better. But actually, when we go over all the information we've talked about following the question, this video is really propaganda for the fishing industry. And you're told that it's local fishing, whereas actually, and that it's a good local artisanal product, whereas actually these are giant boats of over 80 meters under Dutch capital, that unload in the Netherlands, that work on French quotas, so completely destroyed traditional fishing on a local level. So actually, this video is pure propaganda. And the question now is how to fight against this industrial fishing, because actually local consumption is important and there are still some fishermen in Vicon who sell their fish. But unfortunately, it is not enough. Consuming local fish is the first step, but we must go further. So I don't know if you're aware, but a few days ago, together with the Transnational Institute, the Sea Association, as well as another organization, we put together a publication called Industrial Fishing that is dangerously effective, how a Dutch multinationals are threatening traditional European fishing. So, in this study, we go through what we talked about in the quiz on the video in a much more in-depth manner to discuss how this Dutch fishing company ha affects European traditional fishing. Now, before I move forward, does anybody have any questions on the quiz or on the video? Does anybody have any questions, comments? Did anybody wish to react? Um, please do go ahead and um, we can take five minutes for this. Uh, how has this consolidated the labor in the port for processing? Could you repeat? Maybe reformulate it is how has this uh, affected the labor and uh, the processing part of the value chain? Or how has it consolidated the labor in the port for processing? Well, we're talking about fish that's already frozen. So, 
du coup, il y a moins de travail dans l'usine. So there's actually less work afterwards, and also then working conditions are really difficult. It's very cold, frozen fish has to be smoked, so the conditions are not easy. Then, of course, there's a lot more process. There was a lot more processing work at Vicon when traditional fishing happened. There used to be a lot more work. Traditionally, we say that one job at sea is four jobs on land. So there used to be a lot more jobs at sea, meaning there used to be a lot more jobs at land. But now this is much diminished because of industrial fishing, especially in the Ficon area. Alors, he, um, the man on the right, at the end, he says, la pêche is l'homme, like it's men. Uh, and yet, in many of the images of the people working in the processing plants, it seems uh, like there's actually a lot of women working in those areas. But uh, the way that they framed it was this very masculine, uh, sort of noble, um, activity uh, again it sort of struck me that there's a like a spin that they are trying to put on uh, the way that we perceive the industry and then in reality it's quite different Complètement. Complètement. yes sure you can see in the video that the two persons that don't do anything so the the bosses are men and the workers are women in the video, so mostly women. Fishery is, all, is often pictured as a man job. There is one to two percent of women on board, so it's not a lot. But in every other processes to uh, transform and everything, there are a lot of women. So to talk about this question, there is a um, calendar for 2022, which will be about women in fi the fishery industry. So I recommend you to have a look at it on our social media. It's interesting and it's a lot of things that are interesting for you. Do you have any other questions? Tout. That's all. Bon, bah, du coup, je vais continuer. Okay, so I will, um, I will continue. So as I said, we have published a report, a study a few days ago about uh, how, so fishery in uh, the Netherlands. It's part of a collective initiative with uh, urgency as well, with plein mer and uh, Nama. So just to explain what's going on in your study, tell me if you want me to repeat anything, if you have any question, you can write it in the chat, you can also give some remarks. The strategy put into place by these companies, as I said, was fr firstly these companies were family companies and that that's what they try to, to show in the video you can see that um so someone that doesn't really know what's going on in this video could think that so this is a great initiative so i showed this video to some fisher and they were like why that's amazing but that's really not these companies are getting bigger by buying other companies and they also buy processing companies as you can see on the video so these companies are Palivier van der Plaats and Cornelis Rolik, the two mo most powerful in Europe. They have dozens of other companies. And the strategy we have studied in this report is that this, this, comp this strategy has four steps. First, to have more and more um, fishing rights by lobbying, by buying other companies to have a lot of quotas. The second step is to use uh, subsidies. There are a lot of subsidies in the fishing industry. This is a developing strategy. 
the first step is innovation and efficiency to use more efficient um, um, tools. For instance, I talked about trawlers. And the fourth step is um, bad practices. It means that there is a lot of illegal fishing, which help them to get more profit. So let's have a look in a deeper way at the strategy. So if you have any question, please tell me. As I said, first step, to gather a lot of fishing rights. So how to do? When you are a, a multinational, first step, you have to lobby, especially on the European level. I don't know if you know how fisheries are managed on the European level, but what you have to know is that the EU is in charge of it. The fisheries is not in charge of every member state, but it is on the EU level. So the first thing that these companies do is that they lobby on the EU level to have more rights to, um, to catch more fish. For them, it's, it, it helps them to, um, to, the goal is to have a sustainable fish fisheries. But corporate Europe has published a report in 2017, and they had some photos of the Council of Ministers. So the fishery ministers of every member state are gathered. And they had some pictures of this council ministers are not really in intelligent and they took some pictures and you can see that in these pictures there are people who are lobbyists from um, the two companies i talked about so the two big ones so they managed to go in this council and in this way they can ask uh, fishery ministers of every country to um, to increase their quotas in other countries, it's the same. So non-EU countries. Uh, lobbyists have um, put a lot of pressure in Faroe Islands. And there, there is a new law to um, avoid privatization. So Netherlands companies have put pressure on the Netherlands government so that this government put pressure on the Faroe Islands government and they asked them to and they told them like okay if you change the law then you don't have any agreement between EU and your country anymore on the economic level it was a big threat for the health of this country's health so Faroe Islands um, government um, accepted and didn't change its law because this law would have prevent Netherlands um, companies to work in the Ferry Islands. So lobbying helps um, having more liberalism as well. The second um, tool used is to promote big companies inside the attribution of national quotas. As I explained before, there are um, organizations that, um, that share these quotas. And there is a quotas market. In the ne Netherlands, for instance, quotas are managed in a market. And you have to buy quotas. Of course, these companies have bought a lot of quotas and they have become bigger. And in this kind of system, the more capital you have, the more power you have. So these companies have gathered a lot of quotas. And now there are three companies which have 90 to 95% of quotas in the Netherlands. This means that traditional fishery in the Netherlands only has 0.05% of quotas, so basically nothing. And thanks to this system, they have gathered a lot of fishing rights in the Netherlands. They have made a lot of money out of it, which helps them to, to, to do the third step, meaning buying companies in other countries to transfer quotas. And they do that by the common the commune fishery politics. 
policy. And thanks to free trades and uh, free hydraulic and other companies, which have been really um, rich in the Netherlands, then they can go in another country and they can buy fishing industries in other countries, for instance, in Germany, in um, the UK and in France. And that's what you can see in the video. So um, France Pélagique belongs entirely to Cornelius Frolic. So they here there are so net um, capitals from the Netherlands and this company belongs to um, millionaires in Netherlands. All of these um, steps have enabled them to have quotas in other countries and this way to to work more and more and to fish more and more. So do you have any question about that? I will let this slide. Do you have any question? Or you can also um, talk if you need to, take the floor if you need to. It may be a basic question, but how do fishing rights and quota work? Hello. Well, so uh, the quota. Oui. Comment so, how do quotas work? To make it simple, on the European level, the first step are scientists. There are scientific commissions, European scientific commissions, for instance, the C. EEM, uh, so what's the name again? International Committee for uh, Sea Exploitation. He says in English, this institute uh, gathered scientific scientists for all over Europe. Every year there is a benchmark and they uh, have a look at stocks of one uh, species. So they gathered information about a species species and according to this evaluation they proposed a quota so they are scientists of course they can't decide they are not policy maker but they uh, suggest a definition of quotas so how to say so they they suge suggest that to the commission then the european commission makes a proposition of a quota in general, the commission reads scientific um, information. For instance, one expert says that we should uh, fish 500 tons and the commission will make a suggestion. This suggestion will respect scientific um, um, idea or may sometimes not. Then the, the EU commission proposition go in front of the uh, minister's council. All uh, fishery ministers are gathered and they talk about it and they decide together. So what will be the quota for each species? So there are several steps between defining a scientific um, um, opinion by scientists and then the moment when we choose the quota. And there is a, a an issue here. Indeed, EU defined quotas are in general um, above what would be good for sustainability. So, there are a lot of lobbying inside the Council of Ministers. So, scientists are independent, they do their a suggestion to the European Commission and lobbying takes place for um, also for NGOs, for instance, it's inside this um, Council of Ministers. So, for instance, the Netherlands sent lobbyists during the, the Council. The Netherlands are one of the country which which has the most quotas above scientific um, opinion, so they don't really respect um, scientific opinion about quotas for each species. I hope it's 
clear. Do you have any question regarding what I said? I can wait a little bit just in case there are questions. Alors, if the quotas are by species, how is this monitored? Alors, uh, globalement, so, in general, in terms of management, there are controls, monitoring. There are two aspects. They have to, to say, so what's going on with the fish. So when there is a fish um, market, everything is weighted. Each ship has to weight its um, fish in the fish they have uh, fished. Weighting fish um, is a way to know how we are, so what, uh, according to the quotas. For instance, if you have 200 tons for dolphins and you have fished some of them, then you know what's, what's left, what you can still fish. Then you have to know if what fishers say is correct according to what they have really fished. That's a monitoring aspect. There is an unloading, then you weight fishes, and then you control that what has been fished is really what has been weighted. Or other trawlers landing their catch in Irish port and load it straight into lorries with zero controls. Oui. En fait, il y a beaucoup de, 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 de bateaux qui débarquent. Yes, that's true. A lot of fish of um, ships unload their fish without going through this control step. And then these fish are brought to the Netherlands or France. And it's used a lot. Um, um, ships from the Netherlands use this a lot in uh, French ports. The problem is that this is not included in quotas because everything is unloaded in in um, lorries. There is no waiting and everything. But still, ships have to wait fishes um, on board. So there is a part where people have to, to wait, but it's easy to cheat. Do you have any other question about this this um, this question? Okay, très bien. Okay, good. So let's move forward. So second part of the the strategy of the the companies in the Netherlands subsidies. So trying to to grab public funds. There are different types of subsidies. So the subsidies to increase the fishery capacity. This means money to build um, ships. The EU can give up to 60% um, of the price of a fish, of a ship, sorry. In this way, they can have a lot of subsidies because a ship like the one you can see on the, on the picture costs um, millions of euros. This way you can grab all sub subsidies to build ships. Then there are indirect sub subsidies. I don't know if you know that, but um, fishery ships don't have to pay taxes on oil. So it's not like you, when you uh, want to fill, to fill up your car, there is a part that, are, that is tax, which can help then finance um, public system. But for fishermen and women, it's not the case. They can pay without having to pay taxes or very um, low taxes. So this way we don't give directly subsidies, but um, companies um, don't have to pay a lot of taxes. So that helps them. If it's a small ship, it's, it doesn't represent a lot of money, but I'm talking about trawlers. 
which needs a lot of oil. It's about millions of euros that are um, kept every year so that they don't pay in taxes. Of a ship like the one you can see, it's about 10 tons of, of oil every day. They can, it really helps them to, to, to avoid paying too much. I don't know if you know, but there will be a, a meeting of um, WTO and some people are asking to stop giving subsidies to uh, fisheries. It helps huge companies to avoid having to pay. And in terms of uh, greenhouse case, gas emissions, it's also really bad. Then there are uh, subsidies to expand the supply chain. I don't know if you remember, but in the video, there is a logo, which is the EU logo and the Normandie logo, a French region. This promotion video, which is, let's say, propaganda video, has been um, set up with EU citizens' money. So there is an, adver an advertisement for um, fisheries, which is paid by EU citizens. And this type of sub subsidies is not only about marketing, but also to buy, um, to buy industries, etc. So there are subsidies to build um, ships, subsidies to avoid paying uh, taxes on oil and the last type of sub subsidies. This system helps these companies to avoid having to pay too much money and they can expand again. Do you have any question about these uh, subsidies or is it clear? It is clear. Merci. Alors, du coup, Thank you. Oui, je peux. Euh, alors, l'Organisation mondiale du commerce, c'est une organisation donc, qui, euh, qui a pas mal d'impact en fait sur tout ce qui All est. Right. Euh, so the WTO, the World Trade Organization, équitabilité entre guillemets du commerce. Works on fair trade between countries, but um, they want to make sure there's no unfair competitions. Because, and it can be that because if they receive a lot of um, a lot of um, things, a lot of subsidies, then there can be unfair competition. They can then um, prevent certain subsidies to prevent disloyal competition. But actually, WTO doesn't really care about the environment, whether it's destroying the environment or not, whether it's creating greenhouse gases. That's really not their issue. However, they're looking at whether it creates unfair competition and whether it's negative for the subsidy itself. Because in fisheries, because of overfishing, if there are too many subsidies, for the boats, then it will be negative for all the other boats. So that's what WTO is doing. Now, environmental ONGs and our traditional fishery organizations are campaigning to support the stopping harmful grants to fishering, fishery. And this is because fishing is often shown as a factory where, say, the first 50 employees are building cars and so that's affordable but then if you add too many workers then the next 50 then destroy the cars because if you have a fish stock reserve the first 50 fish fisher people will do it and that's affordable but if there are more then it's no longer um durable so you have that kind of scenario where you end up destroying the resources so of course, WTO will look at this attentively, but of course, there are countries without um, subsidies and then there's no fishing. So there are countries who are going to have issues with that, including the Netherlands. And so there is very little chance Well, NGOs have campaigned to stop these uh, subsidies for years, but I'm not particularly optimistic about this. Were there any other, um, any other questions on this topic?
If there aren't any further questions, I will move forward to the next slide. Pushing technological boundaries. It's an important issue for boats that are really efficient. In the Netherlands, before refrigeration was invented, so in the 60s, there were approximately 100, um, 100 different companies for this type of um, open sea fishing. Now there are only three because there are these huge boats that can fish huge quantities of fish. So refrigeration is really significant because in the market, these boats can then provide a huge amount of, of diversity when it comes to fish. They can fish in many different places and they can travel a lot. And this creates a dynamic where the boats can overfish somewhere and then go somewhere else. And this is a real problem. Oh, I mean, it's a good thing. It's, for technology but in terms of fishing this can lead to overfishing especially for fishing units as you can see on the picture that because this boat fishes a huge quantity i don't know if you've heard of electro fishing this was a technique that was developed by the two companies we've talked about before this unsticks fish from the bottom using an electric system so you send an electric current to the bottom of the sea and it unsticks flat fish so it's much easier to fish them now this technique is very destructive and should is supposed to be prohibited by the european union since the 80s however the dutch boats and dutch governments managed to get a waiver this waiver helped them bypass the law and fish with this electric net which created a huge problem, especially in the north of France, because the electric boats fished a lot around the North Sea area. And so the consequences of this were denounced by an organization called Bloom, along with fishers from the north of France, and they prohibited this technique, allowed the technique to be prohibited but unfortunately this was very widely used 12 percent of the boats had these electric trawlers and so this created huge problems because the environmental impact was huge because this technique became prohibited these dutch boats are now using another technique called um sane fishing now, thanks to this, they can fish a huge quantity of fish using, say, nets. But And this is really not regulated, though. And they're fishing species that aren't under the quotas. And so this creates a huge problem in the channel. Now, we're working with other associations to try and prohibit this technique in France, amongst other places. So... Technology is an element that allows these companies to keep fishing more and more fish and accumulate more and more fish. Does anybody have any questions on these technological aspects? Right, so we will now talk about um, um, questionable practices. In terms of illegal fishing, it would be a little defamatory to speak about illegal fishing strategies. I don't believe that the official company documentation says black and white that they're going to do illegal fishing to get what they need, but illegal fishing does allow them to increase their profits. Now, there are certain ways of doing illegal fishing. What they do a lot is what they call hybriding. This is a system where when you have a fishing quota that is coming to an end, for example, for different different types of um, different types of fish, like, for example, hake, and then different boats know this. 
So they'll know that for certain species, they'll have to stop fishing it at some point soon. So for that one same species, there are different calibers. Caliber, size four, size three, size five, size six, whatever. Now, all the different fish calibers do not are not worth the same thing. The largest fish are generally sent uh, sold to catering and they cost more. So boats will talk about high riding where they will just keep the big fish of the species where they are coming to the end of their quota so they can maximize profit. So they will throw back a lot of consumable species back into the sea because the quota is reached and so that's a lot of rejected fish that isn't calculated into their quota. Now that's absolutely illegal. And do go and look at the briefing, the document that we published, because on when it comes to practicing illegal fishing, there are quite unbelievable things that happen. There's bribes sent to the ministries of fishing. It's completely corrupt. There's, of course, aggressive lobbying that's on the borders of what is legal. And then they took huge fines. One boat was stopped at the... Um, at um, at a, a, a port in um, Le Havre, um, in Dover, where they had illegally taken 1.2 million euros worth of fish from the sea. So they then got a fine, but the fine was 500,000 euros. So actually the value of the fine that this Dutch boat had to pay was two times less than the profit that they made through the fishing. Now, of course, um, their, their, their loot was seized, so they didn't get that money. But you have to understand that even though there are large sanctions imposed, actually illegal fishing can allow people to, can allow companies to win that millions of euros. So one could even, people could even talk about some kind of a strategy. And it is very clear that illegal fishing carried out by these companies allows them to boost their profits on top of all the other things that we have mentioned. Do you have any questions on this type of illegal fishing? For examples, perhaps you've got examples that you've heard on the topic. All right, so if there aren't any further questions, I will continue. So, on this picture, you can see a demonstration where you have traditional French fisher people who um, protested against um, the a new large trawler. This is a huge trawler from France Pélagique that was um, inaugurated in 2020. And so they organized a, um, uh, a demonstration against it. There's even somebody you might recognize on the picture. All this to say that traditional fishers and fish consumers, those who eat fish, need to rally against industrial fishing. The first thing people need to do is to gain information, read um, the report that I talked about. Now, Zoe, could you please put the link into the chat so people can, um, can read it? That's really the first step to get information on the topic, to discuss it, and then organize, organize yourselves as a group, because they really don't like these kinds of demonstrations. Companies really hate it. The demonstration was um, forbidden. So it's really important to get organized because it scares the companies. But it's possible to influence them so they're unable to do legal fishing and enter into these practices. Now I can see a question in the chat. Are there, um, are there any proposals for alternative sanctions for legal fishing? Unfortunately not. No, unfortunately, there are no solutions on a European level, but actually this is not enough when we know that they can make a million euros in benefits from illegal fishing. Wow. 
you're sh it's no big surprise that they'll do that. Now, another thing, if you like eating fish, is to go on certain sites where you will see maps of fishing circuits. Now, I went over the whole French coast to meet fisher persons and do a census of um, those who fished where. So if you click on the west, you can see who does what. You'll get to the page for this area and you'll explain that there are two traditional fisher people who are fishing for, like, for example, shellfish and they go and sell them every day next to a church. Then if you go to Camaret, you'll see the page right at the bottom and you'll see um, Xavier who sells shellfish uh shrimp if you go to the southwest of france and the Pays basque there you'll be able to see um for example hake that's sold in a britain area and they'll explain how to eat the hake because of course if you buy hake directly from the fishers you'll get it whole so there's a whole type of work to do in order to consume the fish, which is very important. And this is why we work with the Urgency Network, Catch Institute, Transnational Institute to develop systems. And it helps develop um, the AMAP network, as Judith mentions in the chat. You have um, uh, entities near Nantes. You can see that there's a lot of red near Nantes, and that's a whole load of AMAPs fed into by a group of fisher persons who have organized themselves to distribute their fish in the AMAP networks. And so there are many different systems today to, <clears throat> to develop sales. And that is a way you can get organized with fish people, meet traditional fisher persons, and also discuss the issues in, in traditional fishing so that you can consume what's good. Because actually when you watch the video at the beginning, well, if you're not really informed, you might say, well, that's great. I'll go and eat herring from this company. They're local. They're in the area. Great. They know what they're doing. But actually, that's really not the case at all. So here's a tool that allows you to really eat local fish. And that is this map that you have here. So please do look for it on our website. And maybe Zoe could put it in the chat as well. Do go and take a look. And you'll get loads of information um, on industrial fishing and the issues it creates in the area. So it's full of resources that might be useful. We're always improving the map. We are spreading it out on European level as well, because there are lots of countries where there's CSF and direct sales. So, and so this mapping work really has to continue. So that's what's happening to this end. To fillet and prepare the fish at home, so buy it from shops. I think it may sometimes be an obstacle to direct sale. En vrai, je pense qu'il n'y a pas beaucoup de gens aujourd'hui dans le capitalisme et en Europe et aux États-Unis. In Europe and in the States, I actually think there aren't many people who know how to fillet fish, you know how to cook fish from scratch, because they're all um, buying fish fillets at McDonald's. But actually, it's the role of associations to teach people to eat whole fish. Now, in Portugal and in Spain, there's this real sea culture, there's this fishing culture, and so you end up with people, even kids, who know what to do with hake, who know how to eat fish, who know how to cook it, whereas in Northern Europe, in the Anglo-Saxon countries, even in France, people are less able to do so, but we, on the Open Sea Networks, we will make cooking tutorials to explain to people how to eat the fish, what to do with it, how to cook it. Now, that is really essential. It enables people to understand how to consume fish once they've bought it directly from a fisherman. Now, there are species that are really easy to eat. For example, if you buy a certain type of crustaceans, of shellfish, it's really not very complicated. Plus, um, the fishermen can fillet it on request. They can't do it automatically. I mean, it depends where they are, but there are some areas where they can do it and fillet it if you, and gut it if you ask them to. Now, I'm getting to the end of my presentation, so I might put back the, put the camera back on and stop my screen sharing. So are there any questions on any of this? 
Does anybody have any feedback, any comments? Would anybody like to share their experience? Is it clear? Oui, merci Thibaut. C'était vraiment très pédagogique, très très clair, très 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 très, très bien fait. Non, alors euh, quand il s'agit de de personnes, so that they buy it billeted. I think a lot of people are still able to cook fish. They just don't know how to fillet or gut it or things like that. And I'm including my closest friend who's from a fishing family. Her father was a fisherman. Her husband is an oyster farmer. So, you know, I think what used to happen is the fishers brought the fish in and there were filleting units in the harbor. They've gone because the fishing industry, the small scale fishing industry has gone. So the fish consumption goes through a more indirect chain. I mean, at the best, it's the local fishmonger who buys it from the boat and sells it to local people, which isn't so bad. Yeah, it's good. I don't it's, think we should buy against so that as another fishmonger. Except that he will also be buying Norwegian farmed salmon yeah. and tuna from the Indian Ocean because consumers don't know any better. Yeah, and they ask for it. They ask for it, exactly. So, yeah, I really think what we need is a multi-pronged educational program here to, to build up the skills that have gone and even, even teach people. I mean, I've taught my kids how to cook fish on the bone. You know, I mean, you can, you can bake or roast or barbecue a lot of the fish yeah. without having to fillet it. But yeah. I think you know, learning to add fish into your diet, yes, but not frozen industrial fish. How do we do that? And how do we train people? How do we get food citizens eating fish, you know? I mean, so I think we got to collaborate with chefs, with cooks. Like that's what I we do a little bit up in there, and it. that works pretty well. Yeah, that's part of it. Also, I think that there's a lot of scope left for you to work with the French CSA movement and to identify in other countries, do the same kind of mapping. I mean, I, I think the report is great. The video is great. Your presentation was great. And thanks, Zoe, as well. But I think, you know, we need, we need to take it to another level in terms of advocacy on one hand, and we need to take it down a level to the eaters. How do we get people back eating fish, you know? Yep, definitely. Maybe I could just add to that. Um, one thing I've uh, observed, I think is quite interesting, uh, local catch their work and NAMA, something that they've said about their work in North America is, um, the importance of um, recovering the culture and the festival around the gastronomy around um, fishing and the fishery sector. And sometimes, um, you know, throwing a party where people get to taste uh, the local fish and having sort of, um, because I think something that you uh, lose when artisanal fishing and fishers living and working in the place where the fishing is happening um when that goes away um because of these giant super trawlers you also lose a lot of those cultural and culinary and gastronomic uh events and and knowledge and savoir faire and whatever um and so i think yeah one thing that i find uh cool about nama's approach is really through the cultural angle as well um and then the other thing that uh, the the um, this conversation made me think about is the uh, not only teaching people how to to fillet a fish, but also um, uh, helping people understand that there are many valuable and delicious parts of a fish or ways to prepare and use the rest of the fish. Um, so. It, 
it, there's a sort of actually an incentive to get the whole fish so that you can have not only the fillet, but you can also make fish stock or you can make riette or you can, uh, you know, do different things with the rest and like actually get more value and more, um, you know, feed it, have more meals from, from the one uh, fish. So um, I th yeah. And I mean, there's certainly an emerging, uh, uh, resources, video tutorials, uh, cookbooks, and things that are beginning to emphasize and give some really nice, beautiful uh, strategies and, and inspiration for home cooks to do those things. I think you're right, Zoe, but I think, you know, once it's gone so far that most of the boats either have been or will be decommissioned, and the actual boats are no longer there. I mean, people showed the picture of the harbor, and where I live, you know, it's not quite that bad, but it's almost that bad, you know? And actually getting fresh local fish anywhere, you know, I mean, can be really difficult in some countries now. So, you know, we, we, we have to go at it really strongly from the advocacy to kill the industrial fisheries as well and expose it. And I think the, the work you've produced is a really important work. What we do with it now is the next question, you know? I'm not sure what time this session was supposed to finish. And I think there is another session after this. I don't know. Um, there's just this question in the chat, apart from France and North America, do you know of any other countries having community supported fisheries movement? You're on mute, Thibault. Unmute. Yeah, I know. So. Uh, I would say in the global south, there is a lot of like CSF is like just mm, happening, but they don't talk about it this way. But there is much more like much more local seafood available and it's less industrialized. So there is a lot. I wouldn't call it the movement of CSF though. And I think we are building it in Europe. And then there is local catch in the north of the US and that's it. But I would say there are lots of movements struggling for like food sovereignty in the fishery sector. They are not, all of them are not like CSF, but they are in the same line of struggle, I would say. So if we take an idea forward to the plenary, if we take two or three ideas forward, what would you want them to be? Well, I think uh, the main idea of this, I mean, what I wanted to transmit with this presentation is it's good to consume local seafood. And we have shown that producing tools for people to consume local seafood is pretty straightforward. Just need to like make some feed work, but it's not sufficient because this big industries don't give them, if you're gonna consume local seafood, they're gonna keep making profit. They export their fish in Asia, in Africa, they are international. So there is a need that the CSF movement is not only a movement of um, consuming local seafood and enjoying good food, but also organizing collectively against these companies, informing, uh, organizing protest events, not only about local fish, but also about how do we fight these companies. Yeah, because in Ireland this summer, the industrial fleet hoovered up all the mackerel quota. And the result was that local boats had no quota to go out and catch mackerel in the mackerel season, which, you know, mackerel is really popular with everybody in Ireland. Consumers actually do buy whole fish and eat it. And everything was just hoovered up. The local boats had no quotas left to go out. Yep. In the north of France, it's the same. We cannot eat like herring or mackerel anymore because this company's got everything. Yeah, exactly. So, I mean, 
I think that your report is really important. Could we maybe think of a pamphlet, even a cartoon pamphlet, to hand out to local people in the different languages? Something I don't see the kind of people who need and who want and who would look at this information, reading through a report that's as dense and as serious in inverted commas as this one. We need this report for lobbying, but to get local people to understand, I think we need yeah. something much lighter. Yeah, I agree. I agree. I think to be taken seriously by the press and by politicians, we need such reports, you know, and also to be yeah. build the pamphlet itself. But I agree that it's a bit like <coughs> and a bit too nice. And I, also it's more attractive for people to see like a pamphlet. What we did last year, like almost a year ago, we read an open letter to the president of France Pelagique, to the director, because he said in the press that he was not understanding the fears of small scale fishers and that they were stupid, basically. So we wrote an open letter and it worked really well with the fishers because it was like sharp. We were calling him uh, basically son of his father and like making profit because he had a nice father. So like it was pretty, pretty fun. But I think there will be ways to do similar things with the Dutch companies, definitely. And make it a little bit more spicy indeed. Because now we have all the sources somewhere and all the info gathered together. So we can just quote the brief, but then make something more punchy. Yeah, I agree. Because we really need to bring it down to grassroots level. I mean, if we had something like that in English, you know, I, I know where I could share it. Yeah, yeah, sometimes uh, my colleagues at TNI often have this expression, uh, one cloth, many cuts. So you can start with a denser report and then um, like with the same uh, research, then develop a number of different formats of it in order to reach different audiences. I think um, it's, yeah, it's a great idea. I mean, we talked about it, actually. We are planning to do something uh, in plein air, like a little flyer that we can send because we're going to have to send the calendars of uh, women in the fisheries so we can put like a few flyers with the calendars as well where people can be informed of the study about industrial fishing and not only like speak about gender which is important but also inform them about the industrial fishing in a easy way yep sounds good but you know i think uh we need something really catchy and in different languages, is what I'm saying as well. Yeah, which is not easy because it's not easy doing something catchy in different languages. Oh, I don't know. I don't know. There are lots of talented people to help us. No, I think it's really impressive what you've done. And Thanks a lot for doing all the work you've done, both of you, because I think it's an important aspect. And, you know, people, fish is the forgotten dimension of protein, you know, in, in a lot of places today, over and above McFish and fish fingers and, and stuff like that. Do you have anything either of you want to say to, to wind up? I'm not sure we have. I think we could. Maybe we can give people like a five minute break before the next session. You know, I'm, I mean, from my side, I think I said a lot. If Zoe wants to add something, maybe. No, Zoe, I. Thank I, you so much to the interpreters. Yeah, I echo that. Uh, and I think, yeah, you've summarized and presented it all great so and thank you judith for the encouragement to um think about alternative formats it's something we've been talking about a lot and uh so that's encouraging um because the, there is a grassroots fisher movement i mean i know in ireland all the trawlers sailed up to dublin to demand 
greater justice from the state. I mean, instead of giving our quotas away to other states, because we have like 60% of the waters and 20% of the fishing rights. So, I mean, Ireland is a, is a special, especially hot potato right now. And I think people are very receptive. I'm gonna send the report to one person I know at home who will make good use of it. But I think, you know, we need we need something that is accessible to a lot of people because they're not they're not illiterate, but they're not super heavy readers. Let's put it that way. Most of the fishers of my age in Ireland would have left school when they were 12, which was as long as you had to stay at school, you know, so which is not the case for the younger generation. There's also a lot of migrant workers working on trawlers in Ireland now, not necessarily on the very small artisanal ones, but there are, there's another whole issue there because people are not prepared to go into a job that is hard, physical labor and really imperiled. And also, we're going to do some videos with Ben Mayer. Yeah, some I think infographics videos, and videos. videos are great because they're a super way of communicating because everybody will enjoy them as well. Listen, I think you're doing amazing work, the two of you. I'm really, I'm really proud to see all of this out there. And we are, we've still got some time left on developing the training modules for our European project. So that's another dimension. Thank you so much. Yeah, thank you both. And thank you for the invitation as well. I was happy to, to do that. And yeah, good luck for the next uh, days and of meetings. Yeah. OK, see you. Thank, thank you, everyone. Thank you both. Bye. Bye.